Hey everyone, welcome to Cracked with Siobhan Aris. Now sometimes with success, there comes a point in an artist's journey, at least I think we hope so, where your name becomes more than a name. It's like it no longer belongs to you, but instead represents the product that you're selling or whatever it is that you're making. A great example of this is Debbie Bean. Now, when I started my stained glass journey, the name Debbie Bean, at least in my West Coast bubble, had become synonymous with gorgeous, modern, geometric stained glass rainbows. Her work was truly the tip of the spear for hip and minimal stained glass that people born after 1985 actually wanted to have in their home. Today, I'm going to chat with Debbie, the person behind the art, to find out how she went from being in her late 30s, feeling burnt out on supporting everyone else's dreams, to running the successful, globally recognized brand that she is today. Join me as I crack it all wide open. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> hello, hello. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks Good for having morning. me on. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning. I know it's only 9 a.m. on the West Coast and it's lunchtime here. So I don't know. Are you an early person? Are you a morning person? I I I have become a morning person. I back in the day was definitely uh, very nocturnal. And I, I feel like the combination of like running my own business and having three cats, I don't sleep in. So I've been up and at him since before seven this morning. Okay, good. I feel a little less bad then. <laughs> oh yeah. No, nine, I'm like 9am. I'm like, oh, that's, that's halfway through my day. It's fine. Okay. Okay, cool. So, um, when I started doing stained glass, immediately from the moment I laid my hands on glass and started doing it, I knew it was something I was going to be doing for a very long time. I wanted to dedicate my life to it in a very big way. And so um, I learned from my mother-in-law over a weekend out of town on a trip to their house. And I came back to Los Angeles and I signed up for classes at the Pasadena Stained Glass Supply. Mm -hmm. And I know that's where you took classes as well. Yeah. And so because I was already so sure of what I wanted to do with glass and how I, you know, I was like, oh, this is what I'm doing. I'm moving forward as a stained glass artist. I was very open about that and discussed it with my um, fellow students and teachers. And the teacher, the main teacher, which I cannot remember her name. Do you remember was her it, name? The blonde lady? Donna? Donna. Yes. Right? That was it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I remember telling Donna, I want to be, you know, this is what I'm doing. And she was like, oh, have you heard of Debbie Bean? And I was like, no, I haven't. And she was like, oh, well, she's a stained glass artist. And um, here's some of her stuff. And that was probably the first of <laughs> a thousand times I heard your name. I, you know, anytime I said, yeah, I'm working on stained glass and this is what I really want to focus on now. It'd be like, oh, like Debbie Bean. Debbie Bean, Debbie Bean, Debbie Bean, Debbie Bean. It was just like, no, I'm not like Debbie Bean, but I was so impressed and curious about how you got to a place where your name is Perfect. global. Yeah. Uh, it's become the brand. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that took a lot of work. I know that didn't happen overnight. So mm -hmm. I really want you to talk to me today about how you got to where you are now. Um, <laughs> it's so, cra it's so crazy. Like, um, I don't, I just don't see myself that way. So like when, so you telling me that like, oh, your name keeps coming up. Like it's, it's a little mind boggling for me. I'm, yeah. cause I'm just so like, I'm a little bit tunnel vision with just like, I just focus on my work so much, yeah. you know, I, I do think that some of it is, um, just, I was very fortunate that when I came back to stained glass, cause I had done it not at all professionally, but I did it when I was a kid briefly. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I, similar to you where, when I, was like, Oh, I'll just do this. Like as a hobby, like instantly was like, Oh no, no, no. This is what I need to be doing every day. Can you tell us a little bit about 
your career before you did stained glass. So I know you're from Woodland Hills, right? You're from the yeah. Valley, mm-hmm. which for our, listeners, girl. <laughs> for our listeners that don't know much about the Los Angeles area, it's just North of Los Angeles proper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. When I get really excited, my likes come out a lot and it becomes really obvious that like, oh my God, I grew up in the Valley. Um, And uh, there was like zero going on in the Valley when I was growing up. And, um, but my parents did have stained glass in their house Mm -hmm. and um, uh, we had to replace we had this really big panel in our bathroom door and we had to replace it. And they actually replaced it with that like faux stained glass where it's just like, um, I don't know, where it's like film, whatever overlay. Yes. But I got, they allowed me to kind of help design it. And it was like my first experience arguing with someone and being like, no, this is how the design should be. And this is how I see it. And they didn't understand my vision. And like, they, we made a compromise. And like, to this day, I've like told my parents, like, I want to redo it because I didn't like their design it's choices. My, there. Oh yeah. I mean, and mind you, like I'm 45, I was like 10 years old when this happened. And I was like, no, the rosebuds need to be closed. And he's like, no, but they would be open. I'm like, no, no, no. But visually 10 years old, this was me. Um, and uh, so I don't know, like, I just feel like stained glass like, and designing stained glass clearly was just like in my blood from like a very young age. And then um, when I was a teenager, I was like a typical like punk rock kid who ditched school. And like, again, I can't stress this enough, like growing up in the Valley, like I was such a weirdo, like um, I, like one of these girls, not like the other. Um, So I never went to class, but I wanted to graduate. So I had to take some night classes and there was a stained glass class. And I was like, oh, I like that. So that was what I did. And um, I really fell in love with doing it. Never thought it would be my career because I fell in love with photography. And so, um, you know, my, my like 20s and 30s, I did that thing of like, I didn't believe that it was possible for me to make a living as an artist and my dad's a CPA. And so I, and I grew up in his office. And so what I would do is I constantly would find myself like in the supporting role for other artists, whether it was, you know, I was a studio manager for a photographer when I lived in New York, um, I was um, a personal assistant for like a rock star at one point when I was living in LA. Like I then was like helping like small businesses run their business. And, um, and like, I had a lot of like fun, exciting things that happened. Like when I was doing like my photography, I just couldn't do it commercially. I had such like the artist mentality and I couldn't make that jump even though like I photographed a lot of the bands um um like in the freak folk scene when I was living in Brooklyn like I photographed a lot of those guys and like I went on tour with them so I did a lot of fun things in between like basically being like studio managers for different artists and um I have to say I think a big part of it was my husband's a software engineer. And so he doesn't think like, oh my God, my art. And don't you understand? Like, there's none of that. And he saw like some of my old portfolio and he just looked at me and he was like, why aren't you doing this? Like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, you don't understand. We have these things called bills and we need to pay them. And like, this is not something that's happening. And he basically was like, uh, you're really unhappy. Just go do something that you love. And that's what led me to taking going back and being like, well, I really loved stained glass when I was younger. Maybe I'll just take a class and for a couple hours every week, I'll do something artistic. And that was really as far as like my business plan had gone, (laughs) like there was nothing. And I think similar to you, what ended up happening is like the moment I cut like my first piece of glass, I was just like, oh my God, it was like, I could breathe again. And I just, it was just like, I reconnected like with that childhood love and was just like, oh, this is what's been missing. And, um, 
we we had we were living in Tahunga at the time and we had the, we were staying we were living in this little craftsman house that had like a little detached like shed it might have been a garage it was teeny tiny like there's no way it could have been that so um and Greg built me a workbench and that was going to be our studio which was our studio for like a day and then he came in a few days later and I'd taken over the whole workbench and I was like what like this is like what I do now um and I think that that also I think two things like really fueled like my like insanity in running my business and one was like I had spent so many years just like doing things that I didn't love um and also I was just you know we had we had bills to pay you know and I didn't feel comfortable having him take on the financial responsibility of everything and so we I actually sat down went through our finances and figured out how we could go from like a double income household to single. And, you know, the answer was, okay, we don't go out. (laughs) We don't Mm -hmm. shop. We don't go on vacation. We don't do anything. Um, And I just get to work. And that like level, I I just took that so seriously. And, um, And basically I kind of gave myself in the back of my mind, like, okay, I have six months to see if this is going to work out. And if it doesn't, then I'm just going to go back to like, I don't know, figuring it out some other way that makes sense. And, um, doing like business management, uh, really boring stuff. So, um, I, um, so yeah, like I was saying, like, you know, so cut to, I just started posting things on Instagram I also, you know, the benefit of living in Los Angeles, um, you know, it was when like these like craft fairs were really starting to happen more. And um, I just applied to all of them and I didn't expect to get into any of them. And I thought, well, if I get into one or two, that will be great. And I just kept getting into them. And so what that did for me is that again, it's sort of like was putting accelerant on my business because it's one thing to like, just be in your studio and like you make things and you're isolated from people. And like, you're just like posting stuff on Instagram. And like, now I know people like use TikTok and a million other things, but like, you know, what this forced me to do was like to go out and see how people respond to my work, you know, like, oh, I had to think about packaging. I had to think about like, oh, I should put a hang tag. Like I didn't have hang tags, you know, like all these things that like, I might not have thought about. um, I really had to think about. And, you know, even when I started my business, I wanted to make it so that like, there was sort of like no turning back for me. And it's why I used my name and I didn't have like, um, I didn't have like a brand name. Like I wanted it to be clear that whatever I did, this was about, this was me, you know, like my work is a reflection of me. You know, I'm the, the artist, the creative director, the designer, the manufacturer, like I'm everything. Like now I have people that I work with, but, um, and it sort of was like, for me, like getting rid of, like there was no training wheels, like there was nothing for me to fall back on. Like I just kept putting honestly a lot of pressure on myself to like, just Mm -hmm. make this happen. And so, you know, for every time I would have an event, like the first event I did, I didn't have inventory. I didn't have anything. So I had to like, just like work and like create inventory, you know? And then like, I saw like what people responded to. And like, for me in the beginning, I really wanted to do like large scale work, like who doesn't? And what the feedback was, oh my God, I love what your work is. I love what you're doing. And one day when I can afford it, I'd love to buy something, which was very sweet, but I wasn't going to be able to pay my bills. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I always, and I know this was probably like a conversation that he doesn't even think of or remember, but years ago when I was living in Brooklyn, I, um, Actually, it was at, or I might have still been living in Manhattan at the time, but anyway, I was living in New York. And um, for Thanksgiving, I went to this artist, Dan Witz. I went to his house for Thanksgiving. And he's like a really famous like street artist and painter. And like his work has now been like used for like Dior. Like he's huge. 
And even at that time, he was a really big deal. And he sort of lamented on the fact that none of his friends could afford his work. And so he had made these like little stickers so people could have something tangible of his art, even though, you know, he's shown like in galleries worldwide. And so I think that like, I kind of always go back to that conversation. And so when people said to me sort of the same thing on clearly a much smaller level, but the response was, I love your work. I can't afford it. I looked at like these larger pieces I did and, you know, everything I do is geometric. And so I extrapolated from these larger designs, smaller work that I like smaller designs within it. So for me, it was still retaining like this larger sense of like what I saw visually, but like a small element of it that I felt stood alone on itself. And that's how I basically came up with this like smaller, affordable line of work for people. And I had spent so much of like my adult life not having money as well. And so I always try to be really mindful of when I'm pricing things that I want to have things that are attainable for people while still also having it make sense for me financially. Right. And I think that like figuring out price points can be um, confusing for people because they don't understand um, overhead. They don't understand the business aspect of it. Um, And I think that growing up, you know, with a father that's an accountant and like seeing how businesses are run, I understood from the beginning, like me pricing like a sun catcher at $35 was like, I, I just remember like people being like, oh, that seems like a lot of money. And I'm like, it's not. I'm like, because the amount of time, the materials, my utilities, like everything else that went into a small triangle it, like there's so much behind the scenes, you know, and, um, you know, with my work, I think what people respond to is that it is, there is, um, I'm really into, like, I have just, when I first saw like the Bauhaus artwork when I was younger, I had already been doing drawings and I've been doing stuff on my computer, like, like Microsoft paint, like really rudimentary designs but the kind of work I've always done is very geometric. And so when I got older and started seeing that there were these um, artists that actually had been doing it before me, it, I don't, it didn't influence the work I did. It sort of gave me license to say like, oh, this is actually valid. You know, like I'm not the only one that finds something calming and like relatable with like basic forms and shapes. And so, you know, um, I think that's why people again also really respond to my work. Cause I'm really, I really like, I think that when you're doing something so simple you have to be really intentional with it and mm-hmm. you have to have the execution be like really spot on. And so yeah. it's why I don't do um, copper foil for my work. And it's why I use really small lead work because I wanted everything to be very precise. Um, And so I think, you know, and so that's sort of how, you know, my name really went out there. And in terms of like the wholesale aspect of it, I got really comfortable with rejection and non-responses from people. Like I... I, every, you name it, like every store imaginable, I, e- I emailed every single store. Hi, I'm Debbie Bean. This is what I do. Hi, I'm Debbie Bean. This is what I do. No. Okay. Hi, I'm Debbie Bean. Hi, I'm checking back in with you. Hello. I will be stalking you. Hey, and I like, just wanted I, to circle back. I feel yeah, like that's like, like the sentence I start with a lot. I'm just circling back. It's like, yeah. no. <laughs> no. And there, and there are stores that I'm not joking. It would take me two, three years to get my work into their shop you know, or they don't even know that I reached out to them. And then year, like five years later, hi, I love your work. You know, I'd like to have you in my store. And I think it's just so much of it on my end is I've just been really tenacious and really persistent and, um, and not uh, taking any kind of rejection personally, 
like I just got like a really thick skin for like, oh, that store I love doesn't know I exist, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. Well, right now I looked at your website. You're at over, you have over 50 stores that stock you. Uh, 30 of them are U.S. stores. You're also international, Canada, Japan, the Netherlands. Um, so you, you've, you've figured it out. You figured out yeah. the wholesale market. You've also said a few things that I really want to like, I want to circle back and, yeah. uh, and touch on. One is that when you started, you were willing to make sacrifices, Mm -hmm. right? You were like, mm -hmm. we're not going to go out. We're not going to mm -hmm. eat out. We're going to buy groceries. And I think mm -hmm. that that's really important for somebody to hear mm -hmm. that's just starting out that has lofty goals. I mm -hmm. think you got to know that it, you can't do it all. You got to like make them some sacrifices at yeah. the beginning. The second thing that you mentioned was you set these short-term goals ahead of you. You would apply to these craft shows mm -hmm. um, and not have the inventory for them but see if you got accepted. And then that would give you a specific outline of what you needed to do between mm -hmm. where you were and where you need, needed to go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important too. And the third thing that you said, which was, you have to be persistent. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you have a no, it doesn't mean anything. There's mm -hmm. so many stores, there's so many other doors and windows you can knock on. You just yeah. have to keep going. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, that. I, it's also why I always um, mention my husband because I, and this is like a, I don't know if it's a pet peeve of mine or what, but like, you know, it's like everyone reads these stories about like, oh my God, how did you start your business? And they're like, it was just me and my garage and my husband's money or my family or my trust. It was just me and my trust fund. You know what I oh, mean? Brother. And like, and I, uh, and it, it, you know, it's like finances are a very personal thing and I get that, but I don't, I don't want to, um, be disingenuous about the fact that like, yeah, I I'm married. Like, you know, like I had someone who was willing to make um, a sacrifice with me. I know other people have like, you know, use their savings or, you know, in the beginning I did have some small, um, jobs I was still doing. And it was funny. They actually very quickly like fell away. And that was like, never like getting work was never an issue. And so for me, if anything, it was sort of like, oh, the universe or whatever was just like, no, 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 this is what you should be focusing on. And, um, there was definitely, a, I will say there was definitely a few times in the beginning where I was just like, I'd look at like how little money I was making. And I would go back to Greg and be like, okay, I'm, I'm quitting. This isn't fair to you. And he was like, nope, keep doing it. Keep doing it. And I was like, okay, okay. And, um, I launched my website in August of 2014 and I had my first, you know, and holiday time is, you know, it's like the big money making time for any kind of like small business. And um, I had, uh, which is so laughable, my numbers now, like I would, I would be like in tears today, but um, I had in my mind a successful December. I mean, I literally would go to yoga and have stained glass in my trunk and like people would come after class and I'd, you know, be like, this is what I have. Do you want any of this? You know, like yes. I was like driving work to people's homes. Like oh I was gosh. like doing events. Like I really was like, I was just like anything like you want it. I'm going to make it yeah. happen. That and reminds me it, of like coming out of clubs in Hollywood and having somebody like sell CVs out of the back yeah, of their truck exactly. like pulled up in front. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like I was, I, I had no shame. Like I didn't care. <laughs> and, and it was that. And, and because it went well, I had like that moment. I'm like, Oh, I think I can do this. And then of course, you know, January happens and you're like, wait, where did, where did <laughs> you all go? Where yeah. did you all go? And, and, you know, and so then I would have to be like, okay, like, you know, you have to learn like the cycles of like people's like buying habit. Like there's, there's a lot to understand in depending on what, you know, it's also like, depending on what kind of business you want. Like, I think there's like all those things that like, for me, again, I think because I was older, there were a lot of things that like, I knew I just didn't want to do like working seven days a week. I was fine with that. Like, I don't care. Like I, I had no problem doing that, but like my had, um, 
um, a se- and this is the part where I get emotional. I had a um, senior <laughs> dog and um, he, it was really important for me to be able to take care of him. <laughs> and so like working from home enabled me to like take care of like my very <laughs> old little chihuahua. I have a, I have a dog who's 18 right now. So I'm literally like, my, I mean, my little boy lived until he was 18 and like, you know, like I, I don't know how I did it because like literally like around the clock care for him, but like, that's what was important for me was to take care. Like I didn't want to have a job that like I was away from him, you know? So I created a, I created a career so I could take care of my dog. You know what I mean? Like that's what was, I don't have my children all, I always joke, my children all have tails. Like I don't, I don't have kids, you know, but like, yeah. I want to be there for my animals. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. You know, for me, uh, creating this like wholesale direct to consumer business, um, you know, it enabled me to also do the other things that I loved. And then, you know, I think two years into doing this, we actually went on a vacation and I was just like, my eyes were rolling in the back of my head. Like I knew it was time to stop working when I would like really cut myself in the studio. I mean, like, that's the other thing, like, right. We're like working with sharp objects and, you know, I'm working like 10, 12 hour days every day. And like the way that like, I knew it was time to like walk out of the studio was because like, I was like covered in cuts and I was like, okay, I think it's enough now (laughs) I can stop working. Like that was my idea of like work-life balance in the beginning. Like, oh, I've injured myself. Maybe I can walk away from the studio. You're like, I have to leave because I need stitches. Because I'm bleeding, yeah. <laughs> um, how do you feel now about your work-life balance? Is it is it different? Yeah, I mean, is it different? Yeah, it, it is different. <sighs> I work a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I just, I work a lot. Um, but like, again, uh, I love what I, I genuine, I genuine. So there's two folds, right? Like one, I love what I do. And also, um, I get that, like, I, it's like a deep honor for me to make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, but that being said, I will now gasp, take a weekend off. I'll still, I'll still, I still do a little work. <laughs> I still do a little. I say that I'm like that's not entirely true. But like I started doing like radical things like I took my email off my phone because I realized I'm like I deal in stained glass. I'm not a doctor. Like there are no stained glass emergencies. If you're emailing me at nine o'clock at night, like I don't need to respond to that email, you know? Yeah. But in the beginning, like every email is like, oh my God, oh my God. Yes, yes, I will have that too, you know. And I don't, I don't do that anymore because it, it, it was too crazy making for me, you know? Um, I do, I wake up early in the morning. Like I'm up usually around six o'clock. Sometimes my cats think that I should be awake at five in the morning and that's just upsetting. Um, (laughs) but usually the way I start my, you know, the way I've always started my day is like, I wake up, I feed all the animals, um, I drink my tea and like, I open up my laptop and I kind of look at like, the day ahead, like what I need to do. Um, and then like, I'll walk into my studio, which is my garage and, you know, depending on the day, um, and I'm sure you've experienced that. I think people might have this notion that like, I'm just like in the studio and (laughs) soldering and like making art and it's magical. And I'm like, the amount of time I spend on my computer is crazy. It's, it's half the work, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like some days it feels like that where I'm oh, like, yeah. wow, I didn't even touch glass. I literally was doing yeah. admin work all yep. day long. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, so it depends. So it's like, you know, I think the thing for me is I've learned to not be so attached to my emails. I think that was like the biggest learning lesson is that, um, especially because like, uh, like I said, in like one of my former lives, like I was a personal assistant for like a very famous musician. So I just was so used to like, like you had to respond all the time, you know what I yeah. mean? And like, who was, who was it? Can you tell us? Oh yeah. Yeah. I was Scott Weiland from Stone Temple Pilots. Um, and, um, which is funny. Cause like, 
um, I was never a fan of their music, which was like a conversation I had to have with him like two weeks into it. I was just like, so I don't live under a rock. So I obviously know who you guys are, but I never listened to your music. And he was, um, I had that moment of like, oh, that's why you're famous. He's like, oh, you should, it's really good. And I was like, okay. I was like, I am way too punk rock to have ever listened to Stone Temple Pilots, but, um, you know, went on tour with them for like a year and they're all, everyone was great. And they were also like all super hardworking. Um, he was like, he was, he was a super hardworking dude. Like he woke up even when we weren't on tour and like, we'll go into his studio. Like he was always working. And, um, you know, I think a lot of like my work ethic, um, just comes from, that I've always had like really demanding jobs. I also, um, cause I'm a weirdo. I spent some, spent some time in the mountains with like Tibetan llamas and like, you know, we, you know, up six in the morning, doing your prayers, like make the tea, have your breakfast. And then, um, I would assist. Um, there's one, one monk that I spent a lot of time with, um, who's like this master artist. And like, we would be painting all day. And like, you know, uh, really the day started at six in the morning and like, we would go until like eight o'clock at night. And so like, I'm just used to understanding that like, whatever you're doing, if it's something that's important to you, I don't know an artist that doesn't work long hours. And I think that like, you know, there's a lot of talk about like not glorifying burnout and like not glor glorifying like overworking. And I, I get that. And it's why like I, I did take my um, email off my phone and why like I will like I do my yoga, like I'll go for a walk, like I do other things outside of this. But, um, you know, uh, that work life balance, I think, especially when you run your own business, like it's a little hard, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think it's very different than like, if I was working for like a big corporation, like, yeah, you have to have definite, definite boundaries. And it's why I'm also super, I try to be super mindful of like my assistant and anyone that works for me. Like, I really try to learn from like the bad past experiences I've had <laughs> working for mm, people. That probably helps a lot, actually, having yeah. an assistant, having been an assistant. Yeah, exactly. Like I really try to do things like I really try to not do the things that like I endured and I try to be real. like I'm also I also always feel very fortunate. Emmy, who's been with me for several years now, she's just like like a dream come true. You know, I had I've had other people work in my studio. I've had people that work briefly. I had people that just didn't weren't the right mix, you know, like teaching, you know, anyone that's been in my studio, I've had to teach them how to do stained glass. And like, it's not for everyone because I've been doing this long enough. Um, I'm able now to, um, I'm able to control a little bit more, you know, like my output and like what, what I'm doing and where I'm in the beginning, I think it's natural to feel like, oh, I have to keep doing that because if I don't keep doing that, people will stop shopping with me or I'll disappoint people, you know, and it's like newsflash, you're going to disappoint people. You right. Know, yeah. No, I, I think honestly, like one of the things I tell myself often with every, all of my projects in life, whether it be personal or professional is that you'll never get a unanimous, a unanimous vote. You'll never get a unanimous vote, no cool. matter what you do. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I know I'm like, I'm, I'm really good at rambling. <laughs> so no, everything you've said is like so useful. And I think you've given some like really hot takes, some good hot tips about like where you need to be humble in your beginnings in terms of like selling things out of the trunk of your car, mm -hmm. um, making sacrifices, like I mentioned, yeah. um, understanding that those luxuries of being able to, um, set boundaries around studio time. They, mm -hmm. They're going to come later. Yeah. But if you just stay the course, you'll get there. I mean, I, you know, I am, um, my birthday is in December and um, I'm Jewish. And so Hanukkah always falls at a different time. And then my husband's not Jewish. So it's like December for me really in, cause November, 
Um, you know, everyone's always shopping before Thanksgiving. So you have for me, like all these like holidays, my birthday, like all these like big events during like my busiest time of year. Mm -hmm. And like, I, like, we got to the point where one year I just was like, I can't come to Thanksgiving because when I do, I start crying because I'm so tired and all I'm thinking is all the work I need to do. Like for years, every, every weekend that my birthday fell, um, every year that my birthday fell on a weekend was the Acro Park craft fair. And I worked, I worked on my birthday, you know, there was yeah. no, oh my God, you guys, it's my birthday. Like, no, no, no. Like I, I worked and everyone was like, oh, isn't that awful? I was like, no, it's awesome. Cause I made all my friends come to the event, you know? And then I got to interact with like people and they were just like, oh, it's your birthday. Happy. You know, I got all these people that got to tell me happy birthday and, um, and then give me money for my work. It was great, right. you know, but like, you know, like, um, it is, it's a lot of sacrifices and also, um, I think things are also very different now and I'm sure you've experienced it because a lot of the other, it doesn't matter, stained glass, ceramic, painters, like you name it. Like, I think a big problem now is that, um, you know, we're in the world of like Pinterest and like people just like seeing stuff and being like, oh, I can make that. Like that was, that's, I don't, I don't do craft. Mm -hmm. I don't do craft fairs anymore. I, um, Partially, obviously last year, no one did them. Um, but, uh, you know, now I'm at a point in my business where I don't think I'll be doing them maybe every now and then, but, um, like, you know, I'd have people come up as if I'm not sitting behind my booth or whatever and like point and like, look at their friend and be like, oh, this is so great. Can you make this for me? And I'd be like, hi, I, I sell that. I mean, I, I made that I designed that. And, you know, and then they would look at me and I'm just smiling. They're like, oh, I guess you want me to buy that from you. And I'm like, or not. It's it's cool where you can just be rude and keep it moving, you know, but like I make a living making rainbow triangles. Like I'm acutely aware of like, um, you know, um, the fact that I make something that anyone can look at and be like, I can do that. And, um, and then they're like, look, I did a really bad version of this and now I'm trying to sell it on Etsy, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I just grew up, um, with such a like insane love for, um, abstract artwork. Like it is the thing that like, it's, um, it's the thing that just made me feel like alive and connected and, um, you know, so much in the same way that like the, like punk scene did for me when I was younger, where I was just like, Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not a complete alien in this world. Um, and so did, you know, like the first time, like I saw like a Mark Rothko painting in person, you know, where I was just like, Oh my God, like this, just like the connection I had for it. So you know, it's, it's a hard thing to explain to someone that doesn't come from like the art world that like um, this like sort of like distilled version of what I do of like this very sort of like basic like geometric shapes that there's like a much larger context and story for it. Um, I do think that people just like intrinsically get it, which is why my work resonates with people so much, you know, like there's just something about it that people always tell me, you know, like they just respond to it. And I'm always like, oh, okay. (laughs) It's not just me, you know, but that being said, you know, um, I just think that's like a weird thing of like people, um, like they learn technique and sometimes not even that, you know, I'm like, I consider myself to always be learning, you know, like I think I'm, you know, my job is to constantly um, be a student and to constantly be playful and to constantly explore new things and to be okay with like, oh, I was doing that. And like, oh, that's not how I should do that. And let me like, you know, I picked up a bad behavior or whatever but that's where I'm coming from. Right. Like that's like, that's my approach. And I think that, um, I just, I don't, I can't speak for other people. You know, I don't know what goes, I don't know what goes on in their minds, but it just, what it seems like at least externally is that like, um, 
people see something on interest or on Pinterest or on Instagram or wherever and are like, oh, I can make that, which like, fine. You want to make it for your house. Like I'm like, I, I get it again. Like I've had, I've been broke. I've known what it's been like to be like, oh, let me see if I can make that for myself. Cause I can't afford it. Like that's, that is like a completely different beast, right? It's another yeah. thing to be like, I saw this, so I made it. I now I'm saying I made this and I designed it and it's mine. Like that's, that's like a really weird it's violating. Yeah. And it's, and it's, um, it's not, a, it's not being an artist. Yeah. And it's also, I don't know. It's, it's weird. I, tr- you know, uh, I try to not like seek out looking for other people that are copying my work. Um, it's definitely, I think a thing that we've all done where we're like, oh, what are you doing? You know? Um, and on, on occasion when it's like, just so over the top and I do re- reach out to someone, I'm, I try to be as mindful and as kind as possible and not just come from like that place of like, oh my God, you've done this to me. Cause it's not personal. Right. Like that's the thing that I've learned. Like no one is coming after me per se. I mean, even if they are, it has nothing to do with me. Like this has to do with like uh, ignorance on their level or um, an insecurity or whatever it is. And so usually what I tell people is like, Hey, (laughs) this is actually like my work. This is, this is how I make a living. And um, I know it's common in the beginning to copy other people as you're learning but I really encourage you to find your own voice, find mm-hmm. what it is that you love, because mm-hmm. that's going to be so much more gratifying for you, you know, and best of luck on your journey. Because like, yes. I don't, I don't like, I don't want to wish anyone like, you know, ill will, you know? And I think yeah. that I do think that like people sometimes just don't know. And other times I've had people just be like, yeah, I don't just copy from you. I copy from a lot of people and then block me. And I'm like, okay, like, all right, like, fine. Like, God bless. Like, I don't know what to say to you, you know? So, you know, and so it's why, you know, like in the beginning where you're like, oh my God, people know who you are. I think part of like what I've had to do is just sort of have, almost tunnel vision because a, I don't want to be influenced by other people's work. You know, Mm -hmm. um, there was a period early on where people, everyone seemed to be suddenly making like people were making like feathers and they were doing something else. I, I don't know what it was, but something that is nothing like the kind of work I do. Monstera leaves. Pardon? Monstera leaves. There was like a bit big, is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah, I, that might, I mean, that definitely was a trend at one point, but like I had this mo and I, I, and it was early enough on in my career, I was probably already doing it now for two, three years where there was some other trend that was going on that people were really seemed to be into. And it it's twofold. One, it really made me kind of stop paying attention to what other people were doing, but I also had that moment of like, I'm not interested in making that kind of work. And if that's Mm -hmm. what people are really into right now, and that means that like I make less money or I like whatever, I was okay with that. Like, I, I just, I just knew that like, I've had like stores be like, oh, can you make this thing that this other person does? And I'm like, nope. I'm like, no, no, you should probably call that person. Yeah. Or they've been like, be happy to hear from you. Yeah. And that's what I've said. I'm like, I don't do other people's work or like get content. They're like, oh, well, they don't do it anymore. I'm like, okay, it's not what I, it's not what I do. And I think that like, people are so afraid of like, oh my God, I'm going to fall out of favor. Oh my God, I'm not going to be popular. Oh my God. You know, like they, it's really easy. It's, I think it's natural to like, think like, oh my God, like it's all going to go away tomorrow. Um, but you know, I just have to like be at the end of the day, like I have to be, I have to like the work that I'm doing. I have to, you know, I've been doing a lot more commissions lately and like oftentimes when I'm done with them, I'm like, I don't want to get rid of this. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I've like, you know, it makes me like re fall in love with what I'm doing. And it actually, 
was like the, like a unexpected positive outcome from last year was that, you know, suddenly two thirds of my business disappeared almost overnight. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I learned early on from my dad in watching small businesses kind of, um, the biggest mistake they would make is like, if they were like a manufacturer or whatever, you know, they would get like one big client because they were like, oh my God, it's so much money. And I'm going to put all my energy into this one client. Well, now you're essentially just working for someone. And Mm -hmm. if they change their mind, you know, Mm -hmm. or if it's a big store and they decide, which a lot of my friends had happened to them, like in clothing industry where they're like, oh, this big retail chain they canceled my order, you know? And so I knew that going into it, they have like different streams of income. And Mm -hmm. so it's why, like I did the, I did the in-person events. I did direct to consumer on my website and I had wholesale. And I also did like a very small part of it was, was doing commissions, which I always wanted to do more of, but I never felt I had enough time to do. Let's put a pin in this little tidbit of information and advice is to be authentic to what feels good for you. It, it kind of reminds me of being in a, in a new relationship when you're pretending mm-hmm. like you're somebody that you think that they're going to want yeah, yeah, in yeah. a relationship, but yeah. it's not sustainable. Yep. Um, I think that that kind of translates in art too. If they're making something that's you, mm-hmm. it's not sustainable and it's not going to be as fulfilling for them. They might get some sales at the mm-hmm. beginning because mm-hmm. what you do is, you know, does resonate with people, mm-hmm. but ultimately they don't have, there's, there's not going to be much of an evolvement as an artist yeah. past that. Um, in terms of doing things, mm-hmm. um, like in-person events and selling on Etsy and doing direct to consumer and having stockists. There's a couple of things I saw on your website, which I think a couple, a couple terms, uh, some vocabulary that I want you to tell us what that means. And one of them is bulk gifting. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, usually it's more around holiday time, Um, if someone, uh, you know, I've had, I've done this for hotels, for, um, businesses, for, um, weddings, uh, you name it, but like, let's say you have like, um, an event and you want to give out gifts, like going on my website and buying a hundred of something at retail price is going to be really costly. So if you come to me and you're like, I'm uh, essentially putting in the equivalent of not quite a wholesale order, but um, you know, if you're buying in bulk, so if you're buying like large quantities of like the same design or whatever, um, usually um, I like have packaging and I, I do things a little bit differently and I um, price it differently so that people can buy a large quantity of something and do as gifts. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a really specific Avenue that a a lot of people aren't considering doing. And I think it's really smart. Oh yeah. I, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I, I see like, uh, I've seen other people talk about their business and, or even like when I've done, cause I've done so many like of these different like craft fairs and like, I've talked to different artists, they're really happy being like, um, not growing their business past a certain point, you know, mm-hmm. they don't, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it is a lot to like, you know, like I'm a corporation, like I have payroll, I have insurance. Like I have a Mm -hmm. lot, I have a lot of expenses, you know, there's a lot of like admin that I do to run my business. And, um, it's not some, it's not for everyone. It's not Mm -hmm. what everyone wants to do. Some people just want to be like, live the dream of like working out of their garage or in their home studio and selling stuff on Etsy. And that's great. Like I like, God bless you, like go do that. You know, Mm -hmm. I just knew I wanted to do bigger things. And, um, and I wanted to have like a much different experience with my career, you know? So, so yeah, so I do, I do the bulk gifting. I do the custom interiors. Um, a friend of mine started a business where she reps, um, brands for 
a, a lot of commercial work and she, um, a lot of them are furniture brands, but she wanted some um, other type of artist to really round out her portfolio. And so she brought me on um, and I had already, she had um, kicked a job to me years prior that took like four years in the making. Um, and it's how I did that large scale um, like screen that's for that cumulus um, yes. live work thing. Like and that's if, for those of you who are listening to this in audio format, please yeah. check the YouTube channel because we'll be showing photos of all of this. Oh, okay, great, great, great. Yeah, because I can also, I'll send you some more stuff. But like, so something like that, like that's like suddenly like I'm in talks with like architects and like designers mm -hmm. and engineers and like, um, again, because I live in LA and I know a lot of people um, in a lot of different uh, industries. Um, I got hooked up with these like rad, rad fabricators. They do a lot of stuff for like TV and film. And because of where we live in Shadow Hills, I'm not far from like a lot of like prop studios and stuff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those people. And so we started working on this project together and like also now have like other projects we're working on. Um, and that's how like that came about, but that was like four years in the making, you know, yeah. and, um, be patient, like be, be patient. patient. Yeah. And also I have to say, it's like, you know, so much of like my career, like I say, I say yes to things and I'm confident in my ability to execute. And so like, I'll say yes to things. Like I said yes to that job before we had bought our house that we're in now. And I, was basically at that time looking for like an alternative studio space to have been able to actually make it because my old studio was like 200 square feet. Um, and even doing that, like in my, you know, two car garage was like comical, like every workbench was like covered. Um, and, um, and that job, like I ended up having to work on it like at the end of December and beginning of January. So like going back to like work-life balance and sacrifices, like there was no vacation, there was no nothing, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, like I, I just did it. And, um, you know, but um, yeah, I do the, I'm trying to think. <laughs> well, collaborations is, is a huge thing in terms of yeah. broadening your um, horizons and mm -hmm where you can be and how you're making your money. And you've done a collaboration with Dime Nails. Do you want to tell us about that? Oh yeah. So, uh, you know, they're like um, such good people that unfortunately, you know, because of the pandemic, they were a nail shop and they, they ended up folding, but you know, they came to me with this like amazing idea. What they did is they would have, um, they would have different like artists do installations at the nail shop. It was such a, such a great place. I'm so sad that they closed. Um, and so like, and like, she basically was like, have at it, like do whatever you want with our window. She was so smart. Right. And, um, and, but like, we took it like a step further. It was like when I really started getting into doing a lot of like kiln work and doing fuse glass. And so I was working with, um, like confetti and I was making these like mobiles for the store. And she was like, she were, had one of her nail artists um, look at my work and we came up with like Debbie Bean nails where it was like, oh the, she like mimicked the confetti <gasps> from the glass. I had, I, I never get my nails done and I had them give me like a Debbie Bean manicure. Yes. And I was just like, oh, this is why people spend so much money on their nails. Yeah. Like it was amazing. Like I went out and people were like, oh my God, your nails. I was like, I know. They're Debbie Bean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so like that, you know, it's just, I just think so much of like what's happened is part of it is I'm not afraid to like, I'm not afraid to tell people that like, I want to do things. And the other part of it is just like, I, I don't know, like, I just feel fortunate that like, um, I know a lot of people and like, um, I know a lot of people in a lot of different industries and I'm willing just to be like, Hey, if you ever want to do anything, let me know. And yeah. vice versa, people come to me like, um, poster child prints, um, Sonia, uh, I had sent her like a holiday card and I always do all my graphic design. And she was like, Oh, have you thought about doing posters? And I'm like, well, yes, I have. And so I partnered with them and did like these limited edition prints. There's still, there's still a couple available. 
Um, I had wanted to do some textile work. So I knew someone um, and they had like, um, it was like a gift card business, but they also had pillows. And so I came up with designs for pillows. Um, I'm really willing to like see, to like push the limits on like what I can do like with my designs and like not just limit myself to just working with glass and like seeing yeah. what else I can do. And like you said, like these fabricators that um, I work with, um, we're now working on like some much bigger projects. I feel that, like throughout this yeah. interview, I have I haven't said much, but I've been nodding emphatically the whole time because you've given so much good information and such good tips, especially for somebody starting out. Um, do you have, what do you, where do you see yourself going from here? Like, do you have any goals of things to always. accomplish moving forward? Yeah. yeah Tell us always. about those. Um, I think that that's actually where we were touching on like collaborations. You know, the big thing that happened for me last year um, was, you know, when I lost overnight, when I lost two thirds of my business, um, you know, I had to kind of rethink about what I was doing and how I was doing it. Um, mm -hmm. Emmy, my assistant ended up working remotely. I had to completely restructure like my workflow to have her working remotely and understanding, like when work comes in, how much glass am I going to cut down? Like all this stuff. So, and then the other thing is because I wasn't working, doing these craft fairs, like all these commissions that I always was like, oh, I'd love to do that. I have no time. I actually started doing. And, cool. um, and then like that big, that big um, screen that I did for the um, cumulus district, you know, that end up, ended up happening. And then, um, Unfortunately, a friend of mine died and I had done a, I collaborated with him on an installation years ago. And I went back to my um, fabricators and I was like, I have these three panels that I want to redo um, in the same way that I did that big screen. And we created this steel frame for it and we reinstalled it over at Jackknife Records. And actually we're gonna redo like the, the whole proper installation. So all that being said, like, like my future goals is, you know, now that I'm not doing these like in-person events, um, I want to do, which is what I've been doing, which is more of the commission work, more of the commercial work. You know, a lot of the work that I'm doing with like Denver Enterprises is like working on like, you know, more higher end pieces, like still have like my retail line. Like I still have like this affordable line of like everyday household items that people can, you know, um, buy for their home or their office or whatever. But like, I'm, you know, I, uh, like Alexander Calder is like one of those artists that like always like like made like my brain explode from like when it, since I was a little kid and like his playful nature of like making like these sculptures to like the circus that he did. And like, um, I feel like now that like I have this like whole side of my business going, like I really want to do more of like the experimental, more of the larger scale works, more of the, you know, artist works. And so um, like, that's the kind of stuff that I'm focusing on for the future is cool. doing um, more of those. And, and that's actually like a lot of like what my time has been focused on. Like it's crazy over the past few months, the amount of um, uh, the amount of like uh, commissions that I've done for homes. Um, I, we actually took a few days off a few weeks ago and um, like, I couldn't, I was like, why am I so tired? And then I looked and was just like, Oh, right. Because the amount of like custom work that I had done for um, all these homes that like I'm still waiting for like to get photos of. But like I also did, um, you know, uh, for a, a store that carries my work, Somatic Good Fortune, they, uh, they've been around forever and they do a lot of like really high end jewelry, but then they also have like home goods and then there's a tattoo shop upstairs. And when um, we were talking last year, 
uh, I think it was, we were talking about me doing something custom for their shop and then the world exploded. And, <laughs> yeah. and then I like, it came back to her. I was like, wait a minute, I, I still want to do that. And like that just got completed and um, got photos of that installed. And it's kind of amazing. I really love yeah. how it turned out. Okay. So well, again, yeah. if you guys are listening to this, pop on over to YouTube. I'm going to post all these photos of what she's talking about. Well, this has been so amazing. I mean, your story, you know, over the last seven years, you started selling stained glass sun catchers out of your trunk at a yoga studio. And now, you know, when I was doing my research um, in preparation for this interview, I obviously had to Google you and look up as much as I could find. And um, I found over 42 interviews and features. I've, I've so many gift guides you're in all over the world. Um, and these are big names too. I saw multiple articles in Architectural Digest, BuzzFeed, Forbes, hi, Forbes, yeah, um, Refinery29, yeah. Martha Stewart, GQ. I mean, the list goes on and on and you've, yeah. you've, you've done it. And I'm, I just thank you for sharing your, your journey with us. I really appreciate, I appreciate that. It. No, I really, it's so fun. Like I'm listening to you and I'm like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess that's all true. You know, like I said, you know, I will, I will, I just want to really quickly say, cause I, when you said that, I'm like, um, I get, a, I'm sure you get these, e these like emails and DMs too, where people are like, do you want to collaborate with me? And what they mean is, do you want me to send you, send can you send me free work? Free and I'll post. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a whole, I actually did a whole thing in my stories in my highlights about this because it's, you have to be spe very specific. Yes. Anyway, sorry to interrupt you, but I feel very strongly. No, 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 no. I mean, cause that's, that whole collaboration that's, um, business. cause like, just like, just so people know, like, I'm not giving them free, like, I'm not giving out my work. Like, I don't know, like when I end up like in a gift guide or something, I don't like, I don't know about it. Like years ago, sunset, when I was making trays, sunset magazine, mm -hmm. um, I, they, I think they, I think I actually did send them something cause they were like professionally photographing it. And then they ended up mm -hmm. buying it. But most of the time, like when I'm like in a gift guide or like, architectural digest, like any of these places when they're writing about me, like, I just want like people that are up and coming to know that like, you don't give your work away, you know, mm -hmm. like that is not, and like, if it like an influencer is asking you to do that, technically, like they actually need to tell people that like when they are promoting it, that they were given this uh, in exchange, like that is how like advertising works. So people know that this isn't like, like an organic thing, like, like what I do when I'm like, I genuinely love something. Like I live like in my Saba's, my shoes. And so I'm always like, I'm in my Saba's, but it's not because like they gave them to me. It's because like, I just bought another pair. Yeah. You like love legit them. Love you them. Yeah. I mean? yeah. 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 That's worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, I just always think about that. Cause I just get like, like inundated with like, Hey, or like, Oh, you know, whatever, like that, that whole thing. So all of that, wary. all of that press is just been like organic. So it's like, I always feel bad. I'm like, I don't know what to tell people. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I think I've just been fortunate that people I think, you know, I think the I'm message doing. is just to keep your head down, work hard, be true to yourself and yeah. you know, people will come. I think that's the message. I mean, that's been, that's been my, <laughs> that's been my experience, but like, I, I'm constantly in awe and in deep deep gratitude for, um, you know, the fact that my work really resonates with people. And um, I hope it continues to because I'm going to keep doing it. So. Yes, well, your work is so beautiful. You deserve you. all the shine that you're getting. I appreciate and, it. Your work's, um, I, yeah, I, I was really stoked when you reached out to me because I was like, oh, I'm like, your work's amazing. Like the work that you do is um, I've been sitting here talking about myself, but just so you know, um, I genuinely <laughs> let, I let, you have like a real, um, you have a real eye. I like the, I like the soldering that you do. I love that you really, um, you have a very clear um, voice with what you're, you're doing. Um, it's great. I love Thanks, it. Thanks, Debbie. Oh yeah. Kidding Thanks. me? Totally. <laughs> Do you want to be best friends? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay. Well, I guess we should probably wrap this up. Although yeah, I yeah. could talk to you all day long. No, this um, has been great. Yeah. 
thank you so much for joining me and um yeah i'm gonna be watching and following you along and seeing what you come up with next i know same, you're gonna same. surprise us same same yeah i have some projects i'm finished and hopefully they'll get photographed soon and i can keep sharing with people cool let's do it sounds good all right enjoy the rest of your day i'll talk to you soon thanks you too bye bye to see more of Debbie's work and to see what she'll be up to next, you can follow her on Instagram. It's at Debbie.Bean, D-E-B-B-I-E dot B-E-A-N. And my Instagram is at Runa Glassworks, R-U-N-A-G-L-A-S-S-W-O-R-K-S. Uh, you can also watch this interview and you can see images of all the places and the people and the art that we're speaking about. Um, that should be pretty easy to find. Just do a search on YouTube for Cracked with Siobhan Aris. Art is such a visual experience that we really wanted to provide a video as well. So if you have a sec, check that out. I also just wanted to say that I just released my first episode with Neely Cooper. And I got to tell you, you all just really drove home why I wanted to do this. Um, it validated for me the need for this podcast, all of the messages and the posts and the stories I saw. It was wonderful. So thank you. Thank you for listening. And <laughs> you know what I'm going to say next. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Sorry, I have to say it. Um, anyway, that's it for today. All right, my little crackheads. I'll see you soon. Oh,